And thank you all for coming, as Adrian said, for my sort of farewell performance, as, as it were. <laughs> um, as, as Adrian said, Devin and I will be heading off to uh, the University of Tennessee in about a week and a half, actually. So things are, things are uh, coming fast and furious now. But I did want to take the opportunity just to say that I've really enjoyed and appreciated my last five and a half years here, um, both at Ames at first and the, and the last year and a half at SETI. Um, Certainly, all the great colleagues that I've that I've worked with, and the support that I've felt um, here at SETI, and, and the ability to, to contribute um, to the City Institute, and so we'll certainly miss all of our friends and colleagues as we move on. But we're certainly excited to see what what unfolds for us today. Uh, I'll uh, be discussing um, thermal thermal infrared spectral observations of asteroids with the Spitzer Space Telescope. And these data were taken as uh, part of a variety of programs with different specific science goals. And I'll discuss uh, each of those a little bit. Um, but as a group, uh, as a whole, the observations also provide important constraints for the formation and dynamical evolution of our solar system uh, and also the opportunity to compare um, compare ours with, with other planetary systems. And so I've used that as sort of a unifying theme for this talk. The overall goal uh, is to explore the utility of mid-infrared spectra for understanding small body populations in the solar system and other planetary systems. Um, try to keep that in mind as we go through, go through each of the uh, sort of disparate slides. And we will... I'll approach that by first uh, going over a little bit of background, just a little bit of background on debris, di debris disks. I'll start right now with a disclaimer that um, circumstellar disks are not my field of, of research, and there are those in the audience who know a heck of a lot more than I do about them. So, um, But I'll, I'll give a little bit of background, then uh, a brief overview also of small body populations in the solar system. Then the meat of the talk will be uh, Spitzer describing Spitzer spectral observations and results from uh, several programs. <coughs> then a little bit of comparison with data on disks. And something that an, another aspect of these data that I think are interesting is what they are beginning to say about the dynamical evolution of our solar system. And so I'll talk, talk about that a little bit, um, followed then by uh, a summary and some conclusions. <clears throat> huh. um, so, circumstellar disks uh, were first discovered just by the thermal excess, which this black plot, which is probably what caused us to be late starting today because it's not supposed to be black, and so that's probably the technical problem we were having was this, this one plot. Um, if you just uh, measure the, the flux from a star at different wavelengths and follow the expected flux from just the star itself, from the photosphere itself, um, a number of stars have excess at thermal wavelengths. And so that was the, the sign that there were disks, the first sign that there, were, that there were disks around other stars. And there are, there are different types of disks. Um, primordi primordial disks are uh, original debris that form with the star. So as the star forms, um, material accretes to the center to form the star, and there's a bunch of gas and, dis and dust left around the star. And uh, those are common, really common, almost universal for stars that are, for all stars that are um, on the order of a million years old. They become rare at sort of ages of 10 million years and, and almost absent um, by 30 million years. But there are, there is infrared excess detected around older stars. Um, and these are, these are uh, what we call debris disks. And I'll, I'll describe a little bit why. They're called debris disks because it's expected, it, it's thought that that dust comes from collisions of secondary bodies um, that formed asteroids, if you will, after, um, later on, after the primordial disk itself has, has gone away. Debris disks are uh, found around 
5 to 20 percent of stars, these are main sequence stars, so certainly older than, than um, those that support primordial disks. And it's been noticed that both the size and frequency of these debris disks decrease with age in the star. If you can't read this, this is 100 million years, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700. And there are um, plentiful debris disks around young stars and relatively large, and, and they become less common and smaller as you get older. And the reason for this is that the dust itself has a lifetime of on the order of 10 million years, um, pointing Robertson drag and other forces sort of um, force the, the dust to spiral into the star, and it, and it vanishes on the order of 10 million years. And so for us to see these debris disks after hundreds of millions or even billions of years, it has to be replenished continually, meaning that there must be a small body population, at least one small body population around, around those stars. And we're at the point now where we are starting to, to image some of, a few of these, these debris disks. These are from Paul Callas um, up at Berkeley. Yes. The sun has two debris disks. I think it would depend on your sensitivity. The, the, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know whether um, a Spitzer around, you know, a star a given distance away. I don't, I don't know that. It's a good question. You don't think so, right? Right. Right. <coughs> hmm. Okay. 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 You mean the, the contrast between the zodiacal cloud? Okay. One interesting thing about these debris disks is that we can start doing mineralogy of them in the mid-IR. Um, and in, in order to do that, you need, uh, you need small, warm grains. Um, cold grains won't emit enough energy to be seen, and large grains don't really have uh, enough spectral contrast to be able to see the spectral features. And there are examples of um, emiss uh, emissivity features, thermal emission features uh, from silicate materials around, around two different debris disks. And you can see there, there is difference in their spectral sig differences in their spectral signatures. The, this bottom curve with these discrete points here, these are crystalline silicate peaks, all of these. And so we know there are um, crystalline silicates around, around those, and there are a number of stars that have those crystalline silicate peaks, um, whereas this more rounded feature is um, indicative of amorphous silicates in those, whether the, the type of silicate material informs the thermal history of, of the system. Uh, and we do see evidence for multiple disks around some stars. There are, um, some of the thermal excesses are best fit with, uh, with multiple uh, disks with multiple temperatures. Um, and crystalline fractions range from 0 to, to 70 percent. And so one of the interesting... What, what I think would be interesting would be to compare some of the mineralogy that we get from uh, debris disks around other stars to what we know about uh, the debris disks in our own solar system, the asteroid belt, and eventually the Kuiper belt. And one way to do that, um, Liss et al. in his 2007 paper looked at uh, the Spitzer spectrum of this, this particular star, which has a, huge, uh, a large thermal excess and a... And a um, spectrum that they, they analyzed the, the mineralogy uh, and then went from that mineralogy and backed out uh, atomic abundances around that star and compared them to um, comets in our system, in our solar system. And what they found was, uh, what they interpreted is a, a depletion of certain elements um, relative to solar abundances and, and they claim, okay, well, their conclusion was that these uh, depletions were representative of mineralogy similar to a P and D type asteroid in this system. That there was a big collision that a, B, a P or D type asteroid, which I'll, I'll describe in a little bit exactly what that means as far as asteroids in our solar system, um, 
shattered, and that's the debris that we're seeing in this disk. And the problem with making that conclusion is that we don't actually know in our own system what the mineralogy of a P and D type asteroid is. And so that looking at the, these with Spitzer and trying to determine the mineralogy in a similar way um, is an, a necessary way to go back and, and address this problem. And I'm sure that everyone here is probably familiar with the, with the structure of our solar system. And these were supposed to be movies that were going to reinforce that for you. <laughs> but, but they won't. We have two significant, <laughs> um, two significant uh, belts in our solar system. The main, the main asteroid belt, this is a plot of semi-major axis versus eccentricity down here in the right-hand part of the slide. The main asteroid belt um, between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter is uh, those orbits are stable throughout the lifetime of the solar system. They're thought to be remnants of solar system formation. And the second major belt is the, the Kuiper belt out here beyond the orbit of Neptune, which was um, postulated in, uh, in the early 50s and discovered then in the early 90s. And, and um, more and more KBOs continue to be discovered. Along with those two main populations, there are also um, near-Earth objects, which are not in stable orbits. The, those orbits are only stable in the order of 10 million years. And so they have to be re resupplied from somewhere. And most near Earth objects come from the main belt. And similarly, the centaurs orbit among the giant planets and have to be in unstable orbits and have to be resupplied primarily from the, from the Kuiper belt. And then the last population that, that I'd like to point out are the Trojan asteroids that orbit in Jupiter stable Lagrange points um, before and after. Jupiter in its orbit. Um, and I'll come back to each of those populations later on. Compositions of, compositions of uh, small bodies throughout the solar system um, in general follow a, uh, a trend with heliocentric distance. This was first noticed for the main asteroid belt from just visible wavelength spectroscopy in the, in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, where it was noticed that, that silicate-rich asteroids, these S-types, dominated in the inner part of the main belt. Um, these C-type, which were interpreted to have more um, low-temperature silicates and, and carbon-rich material, dominated in the middle part. And then in the outer part were these objects um, that had redder spectral slopes and wasn't quite sure what they were, but they were interpreted to be even more carbon-rich, maybe organics on the surfaces. And those are the P and D type asteroids that I mentioned before. And later spectroscopy in the near infrared, this is all reflectance spectroscopy at this point out to 2.5 microns, so reinforce this with uh, S-type asteroids having these 1 and 2 micron bands due to silicates on their, on their surfaces. C-types are pretty much just flat and featureless. And then as you get further out into the outer belt and Trojan swarms, um, the spectra are still featureless but be become redder. Um, some centaurs also have that red featureless characteristic to their visible and near infrared spectra. Um, although, and then some outer belt, a lot of outer solar system objects also show evidence for ices. This is water ice on another centaur folus and or organic material. Um, and these extremely steep spectral slopes that are also interpreted to be due to, due to organics. And so there, there's this general trend of composition as we move out through the solar system. <coughs> and the motivation now for going back and looking at these objects with in the mid-IR as opposed to um, just the visible and near-infrared um, are, are several. There's um, radiometry and, and thermal properties. We can just use the, the thermal flux that we measure to estimate sizes and albedos, which are fundamental parameters for each object, um, and then also thermal, thermal inertia in some cases. But as far as doing uh, specifically spectroscopy in the mid-IR, uh, what we're really trying to get after is the silicate mineralogy of these asteroids. Uh, the SIO, um, the main, main group of silicate minerals, um, has strong stretch and, and bend fundamental vibrational bands, um, 10, and, 10 and 20 microns. And so especially for objects that have spectra that are 
featureless in the visible and near-infrared, those um, C-type asteroids, P and D-type asteroids, where we can't really determine the mineralogy well from, from the visible and near-infrared. Um, and also there are um, iron-free silicates, those one and two micron bands that I pointed out for the S-type asteroids, um, are actually due to electronic transitions in the, in the iron atom. And silicates without iron don't have those one and two micron bands. So these, all these featureless um, spectra, we can't really determine the mineralogy from, mineralogy from the visible and near IR, um, but we will be going out to the mid IR will allow us to directly um, look for look for these uh, these strong fundamental bands. And then there are also other materials that, that we can look for: carbonate sulfides and PAHs. But um, we don't actually see those yet in, in asteroids. We don't think. <coughs> Now, the Spitzer Space Telescope was kind of a, a modest-sized telescope with an 85-centimeter primary mirror. Um, it has, has on board three instruments that cover the 3.6 to 160 microns, um, both imaging and, and spectroscopy. It was launched in August of 2003 uh, with an expected five-year lifetime from the uh, the Instruments have to be cooled with li liquid helium, and the lifetime is limited by the by the uh, length of time that liquid helium will last. And it's it's expected to run out now next March, I think April, more or less. Um, and NASA has has now approved the two-year extended warm mission in which just the 3.6 and 4.5 micron bands of the imaging camera will be will be used. Um, but the infrared spectrograph will not be be usable anymore after March. I think it's limited by money. There's there's a, another time limit when um, Spitzer is is actually drifting away from away from the Earth. This, in this plot down here, this is the Earth, and this is Spitzer, and it's in a heliocentric orbit that's drifting away from the Earth. It's a little over half an AU away from the Earth now. Um, as it continues to drift away, it gets to a point where it's difficult to communicate with it. Um, and but I think that lifetime is several years in the future. And so I think the two years is, is a funding issue. Uh, the infrared spectrograph uh, measures spectra with a re resolving power of about 100 from 5.2 to 38 microns. It also has a higher spectral resolution mode that operates from uh, about 10 to 37 microns. And also two imaging bands at 16 and 22 microns. All of the data that I'll talk about here, I believe, are taken with the low resolution mode. There, were, there have been over 120 um, small bodies observed with Spitzer so far, and there are several programs um, ongoing which, which should increase that by a few tens, tens of asteroids before uh, the cryogen runs out in March. Uh, these include uh, Objects from near-Earth space, the main belt, Trojan swarms, centaurs. Sizes range from a few hundred meters to a few hundred kilometers, and it includes all spectral classes um, and binaries as well. So it's a big, it's a broad array of, of asteroids that have been observed with Spitzer through these the various programs. What Spitzer measures is the um, <coughs> flux as a function of wavelength, and it's shown here for a warm a hot near-Earth asteroid, um, a cooler main belt asteroid, and a, and a much colder centaur. Uh, KBOs are too cold and faint for Spitzer to, to observe spectroscopically in uh, Because of the, the broad and um, continuous wavelength coverage of Spitzer, uh, we can model the temperature distribution on the surface of the objects pretty well, which allows us to to estimate not only the size and albedo, which is common from doing radiometry of asteroids, but also get an idea of the thermal inertia. For instance, this, this near-Earth asteroid Phaethon, um, this red curve is the best fit thermal model, um, assuming a lunar-like thermal inertia of um, of 50 SI units. But that doesn't fit fit the data at all. The, the Phaethon is, is best fit with a thermal inertia of about 640. Bare rock has 
has a thermal inertia of about 2,500. So this implies maybe for this this near Earth asteroid, maybe a blocky surface, or at least a surface with with larger grains than the than the fine lunar regolith. Um, main belt asteroid Primno, on the other hand, um, is best fit with a low lunar-like thermal inertia. And so this, uh, let's see, the calculating um, albedos are important for, uh, provide, provide an important constraint on compositional interpretations. It's important to know whether an asteroid is dark or bright um, for understanding its composition. Sizes also are particularly important, are, are important on an individual basis for objects. We like to know how big they are, but they can be particularly important for binaries um, in which uh, the, uh, the mass can be derived from mutual orbits um, of, the, of the two objects. And if you get the size, then that provides a density, which is an important, um, tells us a lot about the interior structure of the object, the composition. And Frank Marchi is leading a program which is uh, using Spitzer to look at a, a bunch of binaries, I think 20, 25 or so. And, uh, and here are a few, few densities that, that we've derived already. <coughs> and Lucy Lim, is, uh, a colleague at, at Goddard, is uh, leading a program trying to exploit the, uh, the ability to estimate thermal inertia, um, specifically in her case, to determine which asteroids among the M class of asteroid are actually metallic cores of differentiated parent bodies. Um, the idea is that the M class asteroids are thought to be the parent bodies of the iron meteorites. But lately, some of them have been mm, found to have silicate absorption features and probably are probably not metallic. And so she's, she's approaching that problem with Spitzer looking at thermal inertias. Um, and on this, on this plot, the uh, Objects at the, at the top of the plot are the most likely candidates for actually being metallic. It's it's probably a combination. Um, we don't know for sure. There are much lower densities than that that are found um, for some objects, particularly in the in the Kuiper Belt. There are densities of 0 0.5, 0 0.6 for some of the binaries in the Kuiper Belt. Um, I think for C type asteroids, I don't know what the average. 1.1 is the is the average. What so, is the radii of these objects? Patroclus's radius is around, um, I think, 80 kilometers. So it's it's pretty pretty large. Yeah. But I mean, for the ones that are, you could say that's mostly ice. You could spectroscopically. There's no indication of ice on the surface, at least. It doesn't constrain the interior, but. Um, so that is one in very interesting thing that's coming out of the binaries is that we're finding these very low densities um, on a lot of objects. The binaries are For Spitzer? Yeah. How many binaries have you got to look at? I don't know what the total number of binaries are. Is it up to 100 yet? The total number of binaries now is under 60. The total number of binaries is like 40. Okay, so 160, you said? Total number of binaries is 162. Is that main belt, or does that include Kuiper belt and everything? So from near Earth, there are binaries in near Earth objects, and I think they're more plentiful in, in near Earth objects, right? And uh, from and when you say binary, you just mean any size satellite. Any size satellite. And it doesn't imply it. Um, in this case, Patroclus is an uh, equal size binary, um, but but it can be just be a little moonlit like uh, Ida. No. Uh, Dactyl around around Ida, just a, a tiny moonlet. Also, anything that you can track um, to get the to get the the mass of the system. Is that I think people are are studying that. I think there are reasons to believe that that possibly near Earth objects. Uh, I think what. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Frank. Certainly, you're the, you're the expert on this. But um, near-Earth asteroids have a chance of uh, coming closer to the terrestrial planets, which causes tidal disruption, um, which is a, one of the possible mechanisms for forming binaries. And so it's just, I, I think it's just that uh, the near-Earth objects have this 
additional mechanism that can that can help perform them. Can I yeah, yeah. That's true when you now must okay. have been uh, the yoke effect is the is the main way to form by any and any Oh so solar solar radiation forces spin up the objects and then they split and then they split apart. And that's more common for small that's more common for small objects which we can detect small and, then and close small and close to the sun. So Right. So continuing to observe more objects, more small objects in the main belt would be a good test so of that of that hypothesis. Yes, actually, we observed Patroclus eclipsing itself um, with one object eclipsing. Um, the other, with one component eclipsing the other. And so we were able to derive a thermal inertia from that, from the thermal response um, as the shadow passed over. Um, is Patroclus a Trojan? It is a Trojan. Patroclus is a Trojan. <laughs> hmm? Even though he's a Greek. That's right. That's right. And he's, he's, in, he's in the wrong swarm, too, actually. Um, that's right. <laughs> um, so, so using using that using that technique um, of the the eclipsing binary, the uh, thermal inertia of Patroclus was was pretty well determined to be on the order of 15, which is, I think that's what that's what Michael finally fin Michael Mueller has been doing that calculation. I think he his final number was um, 15 SI units, which is smaller than the than the moon's thermal inertia. Are there any cases in which a binary has been shown to have two different albedo objects? Not that I'm aware of. Or we're also working I'm working with Frank on some observations, some uh, resolved spectral observations of, of two components of a binary to look for spectral differences between the two. Okay, so um, to, to study the composition, the surface composition, surface mineralogy, we want to, um, oops, where am I going? The, the uh, emissivity features are superposed on, on the overall, overall thermal emission. And so we want to remove the continuum emission to accentuate the, uh, the mineralogical features. And we do that simply by dividing the measured thermal flux by the, by the model continuum. And um, this, I've just shown uh, a few examples of the spectra that we're seeing. Certainly some large uh, emissivity features on some objects and some variation um, in uh, the shapes of the bands and the locations of the bands. The Eros band is much shorter wavelength than some of the others. Um, mostly we're seeing uh, emissivity Peaks, but in one or two objects we see we see emissivity valleys, um, and the the turns out that emissivity is strongly dependent on grain size. And so for very s fine grain sizes you get emissivity highs, but for much larger grain sizes you get you can get emissivity lows. Um, so we're seeing clear features and some variation. Uh, Jupiter Trojans for instance, are showing among the largest features that we see in any object. Um, now remember, in the, in the visible near infrared, these are featureless. They don't show the silicate absorption features that S, S asteroids have. But we see, see these large um, 10 micron peaks and, and also maybe 19 and 25 micron peaks. Um, from these, these the regoliths of, of these surfaces. And to the first step to interpret these is just to compare to laboratory uh, measurements of meteorites and, and minerals. And the first thing we can say is that, that these are fine grain silicates. Um, larger grain silicates, like I said, have these emissivity lows instead of emissivity highs. And so we can rule out large grain silicates. They've got to be fine grain. But we don't actually see a great match. If you follow these lines down from the, the peaks in the, in the Hector curve, all of the mineral Meteorites and mineral mixtures um, peak at, at much longer 
significantly longer wavelengths, and there are also differences out in longer wavelengths. Yes, it'll, the, the grain size is actually probably five or you know one, one to five microns is, is what the best fits those those particular features. But if we compare the locations of these features to um, features in comets, they match up pretty well. This is hale from from ISO, and even the 19 and 20 something micron feature matches up pretty well. And this is Swashman Walkman one, which is a a comet that orbits just beyond the orbit of Neptune. So the features do coincide with those in some comets, but we're not seeing any extended emission from the Trojan asteroids. This is a, a plot of a, a radio profile, actually from, from one of the um, Spitzer 16 micron images. The green is a reference star, just showing the point spread function of the telescope. And this black curve is Swashman Walkman 1, which is an active comet. You can clearly see there's um, extended emission. The, the, the profile does not follow the, the star. But the two Trojan asteroids, um, the profiles are, are completely stellar. There's no ex extended emission. Um, and the spectrum from a regolith should not resemble the spectrum from an optically thin coma. Um, scattering is completely negligible in an optically thin coma. You only have to worry about the, the emiss the emission from a single grain sort of added up. But scattering is critical, very important, in a regolith. And it's very confusing why these, why these peaks would line up. And so we've, we've had a lot of trouble modeling the mineralogy of these asteroids for that reason. And the best idea that we can come up with so far is that perhaps um, we're seeing silicates embedded in some sort of transparent matrix. And certain organics are fairly transparent in these wavelength ranges. And if we, um, this, this blue curve is an example of embedding silicate particles in um, an HCN polymer in this case. And we are getting the, the narrower feature than, than we see from the laboratory spectra of meteorites and, and individual minerals. And so, so that's, our, that's our best idea for what's going on with the, these Trojan asteroids right now. Um, Centaurs are further out in the solar system, recently from the Kuiper Belt. Most are too faint for short wavelength IRS observations, but we were able to, were able to observe two objects down to the 10 micron region, Nespolis and Okoroi. Um, both of these have visible and near-infrared spectra that are similar to Hector's um, visible and near-infrared spectrum, featureless and moderately red sloped. And they're fairly similar in, in Spitzer wavelengths, too, with the 10 micron peak and 20 and maybe 35 micron emissivity features. Um, we can do the same comparisons. And, and again, we don't see any sign of extended emission. This isn't an active centaur. This is we're, we're seeing the, the regolith of this object. Um, and again, the same different, different models embedding silicates in, um, in an organic matrix again, is our, is our best guess for what's going on with these centaurs. Uh, Near-Earth asteroids, now coming way in to the inner part of the solar system, um, near-Earth asteroids that we've observed are mostly featureless or show very subtle um, spectral features that could be due to larger grains on the surface. Again, larger grains have smaller, moderate sort of, you go from Emissivity highs at very small grains, and emissivity lows at very large grains, but that sort of intermediate region has very low spectral contrast, and you sort of get just a flat spectrum. And, and uh, I think that's most likely what's going on with um, the near-Earth asteroids, and could potentially be a function of smaller asteroid sizes, that these, these small asteroids have a harder time holding on to their micron size grains. These can be, grains could be electrostatically levitated, and that, that could be enough to eject them off of the surface. And we saw that on uh, the Hayabusa mission to Itakawa. The surface of Itakawa didn't, did not have any of the um, fine regolith material like we saw on the moon. The, the, the finest grain size, I think, was on the order of millimeter, um, a millimeter or two on Itakawa. 
we think we're seeing uh, a feature due to phyllosilicates on the surface of phaethon, which is the parent body of the geminid meteor shower. Um, this this um, dip here um, coincides well with a uh, feature in, in certain types of phyllosilicates, and that interpretation is consistent with re recent, um, recent work done in the visible near-infrared also. But most other near-Earth asteroids are just, just pretty featureless. Main belt S-type asteroids. There have not been very many S-types observed with Spitzer, um, mostly because people were going after uh, objects that whose uh, the interpretation of their surface was unclear from the shorter wavelength data. And S-type asteroids, remember, had the one and two micron bands that can be used to interpret mineralogy. Um, they tend to show weaker features, actually, than, than primitive classes, and I, I'm still not sure why that is, um, but, but we can, it's perhaps not so critical because we do have mineralogical information from the, from the near infrared for these. Main belt C, P, and D type asteroids um, tend to show a, a variety of spectral shapes. The C types um, tend to have a relatively small 10 micron feature. Um, whereas the P, P and D types um, range from large Trojan-like features to, to um, smaller features that, you know, with this, this different um, shape, which is most likely also due to, to phyllosilicates on the surface of this D-type asteroid. Um, once we get a chance to, to go through detailed analysis of each of these objects, um, we might begin to see patterns in the types of features, and perhaps it's indicative of different regions of formation for the different types of objects. Um, that's one hypothesis that's been thrown out that we'll be able to test with these data. Spitzer has also been useful, very useful, for spacecraft mission support, getting data that no other uh, facility can can get. Um, for instance, on the on the left here are Spitzer observations of two asteroids that they're ESA's Rosetta mission will fly by on the way to its main comet target. Um, this is Lutetia at the top, which is interesting because its spectrum, its visible near-infrared spectrum, is most consistent with uh, carbonaceous chondrite meteorites, but it's got a high albedo, which carbonaceous chondrite meteorites have low reflectivities because they've got a uh, large number of opaque mi minerals in them. The Spitzer data confirmed the high albedo, but also confirmed um, the interpretation of CO uh, carbonaceous chondrite meteorite mineralogy. So the flyby of this asteroid will be really interesting to see why, why the mineralogy seems to be what we see for these um, low albedo class of meteorites, but the uh, albedo is, is very different. What was the previous evidence for the Visible. Um, uh, yeah, it must have, I think it was IRS. IRS, uh, not from the ground, but IRS points from the 80. Um, the IRS albedo was pretty high. Um, and the second asteroid that uh, Rosetta will fly by is Steins, which is an E-type, which is a, an interesting class in itself because there aren't very many E-types. Um, and that, that flyby actually will occur I forget whether it's this month or next month. It's really, really soon that, that, e, that Rosetta will be flying by Steins. Um, and Spitz was also used to, con to study the surface of um, an asteroid that was the proposed target for a sample return mission. Um, this proposal was, in the end, not accepted. It was one of the finalists in the last discovery round. Um, and we used Spitzer to constrain the thermal inertia of the surface. We found a moderate thermal inertia similar to, to uh, Phaethon that I mentioned before. And we also got photometric points as well as spectral points. Um, but we got photometric points with higher uh, rotational resolution. And outside of the, the one sigma error bars, we didn't see any um, variation in flux with rotation, which um, implies there's no variation in thermal properties with rotation. So this, this object um, is the surface is most likely blocky. Um, 
pretty much everywhere. And so a sample return mission has to be prepared to deal with that type of surface as opposed to a lunar regular type of surface. Um, so now what if we compare these, the spectra that we've measured. So that's sort of a rundown of the Spitzer spectral observations, um, a brief, brief overview, not, not very brief, but an overview of those. Um, what if we compare those to um, what we see with debris disks? And there are actually only two debris disks shown in this left-hand plot, these bottom two. Um, these are comet, these two spectra are comets. And this is a, a primordial disk at the top. Um, and just from this brief comparison, and this, this, is, this is the spectrum that was interpreted as being the uh, breakup of a PED type asteroid. And just from this plot, this dashed line here is at the same wavelength as this, this dashed line over here. And we see that the, uh, this feature in the, the edge of the peak in Hector is at much longer wavelength than the edge of the peak in this, in this debris disk. Does that mean that, there, that this is not consistent with a P and D type asteroid? Well, not really, because um, we're not comparing apples to apples. Again, we'll, these are optically thin um, extended disks, whereas we're looking at a regolith here. And so we really have to understand better how to interpret these uh, asteroid data mineralogically um, in order to make this comparison in a more detailed way. <coughs> and so, so then another area where these data, I think, are being informative is on solar system dynamical evolution. Um, early on, we saw from the compositional structure of the main belt, um, what was developed from, from seeing how the, uh, the S types were dominant in the inner belt and the C types and then P and D types, the, the view that came out was a relatively quiescent solar nebula in thermodynamic, thermodynamic equilibrium where the asteroids were formed um, in place by material that, that, con that, that condensed under the conditions that were prevalent at that, that particular position. Um, but with the, dis the discovery of the Kuiper belt and, and extrasolar systems and extrasolar planetary systems, the idea of migration really became important, uh, migration of giant planets. The Kuiper belt has a lot of dynamical structure. There are these resonant, ob these objects that orbit in mean motion resonances with Neptune. Pluto is in the 3 to 2 um, mean motion resonance, for instance. There are other objects in other resonances as well. Um, uh, there's a, a scattered, scattered disk. These objects up here uh, had to have been uh, gravitationally scattered by Neptune to achieve these, these high eccentricities. And then there's this, this core of, ob of objects in the Kuiper Belt um, in a relatively restricted semi-major axis range and also um, in fairly circular orbits that are thought to be the core of the original Kuiper Belt. Um, and the implication from the resonant objects in the scattered disk um, and the, the tight uh, semi-major axis range of the classical belt is that giant planet migration was important in the, in the early solar system. Which is, what's the definition of a transient? Um, anything whose semi-major axis is larger than Neptune's. Taking that one step further, um, I doubt very much that this is going to work. No. Okay. That's fine. It was just a little cartoon to illustrate, illustrate this. Taking that one step further, there's been a, a model that, a uh, dynamical model that's made a bit of a splash um, recently, which posits a compact early solar system. This is actually the, the end state of that model. If you saw this, the, the beginning, uh, frame in this movie. Um, the red dot would be about here, the white dot would be in here, the blue dot would actually be here, the, the pink one here, and then, then a, a disk of material out. So it posits a, a comp very compact early solar system um, with a massive disk beyond the planets. And the, in, in this model, the planets slowly migrate outward um, because of scattering with the, the massive disk that's, out, that, that's beyond 
the planets until Jupiter and Saturn cross uh, this one to two mean motion resonance. And when that happens, uh, Uranus and Neptune initially go un unstable. Um, in this model that I was going to show, this blue dot, which um, is Neptune, was originally in here and was thrown outside of, of Uranus into the, the belt of material, which makes things just um, sort of blow up. I mean, really go unstable, mixing things up a lot. And then things settle back down. And they're able to, with this model, they're able to uh, reproduce the, a lot of the structure of the Kuiper Belt. And they also make several other predictions with this model, one of which that I'll focus on here for, for a few minutes are that the Jupiter Trojans come from the Kuiper Belt. And there are a few others, the outer mean belt asteroids may also come from the Kuiper Belt, and, um, where the Neptune Trojans came from, and, and so on. And also the lunar late heavy bombardment date, um, they can explain this way. And so in this model, the, the, or in this, the Jupiter Trojan asteroids become uh, sort of a key, a key test of this type of model. Um, did they form in place at 5 AU, or did they form from the Kuiper Belt? And can we determine that um, by looking at their compositions? And remember early on, I said that the Jupiter Trojan asteroids are mostly D-type. They have uh, featureless um, and red sloped visible near infrared spectra. More recent data, are, we're actually finding two spectral groups in the visible and near infrared. One that's, I mean, they're, they're both featureless and red. One is less red than the other. Um, but they are, it's not a, a continuous distribution of colors. This color-color plot shows, you know, two, two distinct groups. You can see the same thing in the visible. We've measured um, mid-IR spectra of 14 Trojan asteroids now, and, and they're also grouping into two groups, those um, that are Hector-like, which I've discussed before, and then uh, those that, that have a, a much smaller 10-micron um, peak, like Patroclus. And there aren't very many data points, but it, it seems like densities could potentially be grouping as well. Um, Hector also has a moonlet. And uh, it's from its size and, and mass, we get the d density of about 2.5, whereas we went over Patroclus's density before, of, um, load density of 1. So this is consistent, possibly, with two distinct sources for the Trojan asteroids. Um, the Hector group is similar in visible and near-infrared and in the mid-IR to at least two centaurs, as I went over earlier. And so it's possible that, that the group that's similar to Hector came from the outer solar system, but whereas the group that's similar to Patroclus came from 5 AU. Now, if we look at the um, visible and near-infrared um, groups, the, the Hector group is the, the more red group, and they comp comprise about 70 or 80 percent of Trojan asteroids. Um, and the less red group is the remaining 20 to 30 percent. So there's, there's more work to do here, but um, but it does seem like the Trojans are consistent with, with two distinct sources and, and could also be consistent with this, this new Nice model. Um, they suggest a similar scenario for the outer belt, which we can investigate by, by examining more outer belt asteroids also. I think the three micron region will be important for, for really unraveling this. The three micron region um, contains a lot of strong absorptions of water ice as organics. By matching up the features due to these ices and organics, I think we can um, continue to, um, to work on this problem. Uh, Heather Stewart is visiting us this summer from Villanova under the REU program, and she's um, examining 3.6 and 4.5 micron photometry from Spitzer of 17 Trojan asteroids um, to try to answer this question. And if you come to her REU talk in a week and a half, maybe she'll have an answer for you. Um, and there's also an ongoing KB on Centaur study, also using the 3.6 and 4.5 micron bands. We have on the order of 40 or 50 um, KBOs and Centaurs now. And these two bands will still be operational for the two-year extended um, mission for Spitzer. And so we should be able to get a lot more data um, for KBOs. And uh, continued analysis of silicate mineralogy from the mid-IR particularly in the outer belt asteroids, will also be important. Stephen M. has been working with me for several months now on, um, on Spitzer data of several 
outer belt asteroids. So we're, we're moving forward. So to conclude, um, we see debris disks around, uh, around other stars that imply small body populations around other stars. Solar system, of course, has two significant small body belts, and comparing them is, uh, will be important for informing both the formation of our solar system and how other planetary systems form and how likely it is to have, um, have planetary systems, I think.